Okay, Mastermind with Richard Berman and Neil Schwartz. Welcome, everyone. Very exciting. Had an opportunity to meet with Richard for some time and uh, heard lots of good stuff there. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, everybody hear us okay? I think it's going to be a great Mastermind today. Richard Berman's in Reno, Nevada. They call that the biggest little city. <laughs> All right. The Good biggest. Job. Good job. Richard, so your your uh, family, you've lived in Reno most of your, your life, correct? Yeah, basically I grew up here. All right. Good. Good, good, good. Uh, did, did you go to college at all? No, never went to college. Barely graduated high school. I'm sorry, barely graduated, graduated high school. High school. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you and I could just have a conversation about no college and barely graduating high school. I had 19 Ds. How about you? Yeah, well, when I was younger, I wasn't the kind of guy you would have on a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm excited about it today. Absolutely. So, Richard, tell me, you know, you uh, you you had a different business before real estate about six years ago, right? Correct. Yep. Okay. So tell me the kind of work you were doing there. Yeah. So before I got into real estate, well, I've always been in sales my whole life, basically. Um, before I got into real estate, I was working for a company, and we sold uh, we sold specialized cleaners and additives to dealerships and independent garages. And I'd done that for about nine years. Okay, so that was kind of your your education in direct sales, right? Yeah, before that, I sold cars, and then before that, I sold jewelry. Very cool. So uh, the most you made was the year before you went into real estate uh, at a real job was about yeah. $140,000? Yep, yeah, so I've been there for nine years, and I pretty much have gotten to as high as I could go. I was making 140000 a year. Wow. All right. That's nothing to sneeze at. That's good money. It's hard to leave that and go into real estate with uh, no guaranteed paychecks. <laughs> yeah, you could say that. Definitely. Yeah. You were sharing the story that actually you're, the, how you got into real estate. Why don't you share that story on how you and your wife ended up there? Yeah. So essentially my- Carolyn, it's wife, Josie Jellick. It's 12 one second. and- I just heard that uh, through escrow that you're confirmed on your placer circle property. So congratulations. Okay. And um, Richard, let me uh, open your mic, Richard. There you go. All right, Richard, go ahead. Yeah. So I had uh, bought my first house and we had a terrible experience with an agent. My wife got her real estate license because she thought she could do it better. And then she found out it is a direct sales business. So she wound up becoming a an assistant slash buyer's agent for my first real estate broker. Um, Katie and I, uh, I had met a guy at an airport and he had owned a bunch of Wendy's franchises. And he was doing really well with them. He kind of gave me his story. And so I thought I could be working, making 140000 a year. We're, we were really frugal as far as like being able to save our money. And I would buy franchises. Um, so my wife and I were discussing it. We didn't really, we don't come from money. We don't know anybody who had money. The wealthiest person we knew was her broker or her boss. And so I had asked Alan to help us basically buy um, a franchise business. So we were looking at like Papa Murphy's or those round tables, you know, kind of thing. And Alan, every time we would go and make an offer on one that was for sale, his accountant would run the numbers and then he would say, Richard, I don't know why you're buying these. Like you're not going to make any more money than you're making already. And it's going to take you a long time. He says, why don't you just get into real estate? And so I'd asked him, I said, well, I don't know. Can you make any money selling real estate? And so he took me to his office one evening and he opened his books and he showed me 
uh, that time he was going to make, I think it was 1.6 million bucks. And I had never, I didn't even know people made that kind of money. You know, I thought like 140 was as good as it gets kind of thing, unless you like had some kind of empire. So I said to Alan, I go, will you teach me how to do that? And he goes, yeah. So Katie, of course, she knew how hard real estate really was. She said, well, you, you should shadow Alan and see if you like it. And so I shouted him for about six months and then quit my job and got into real estate full time. And then? Yeah. So Alan, essentially, <laughs> um, he said, if, if you're going to get into real estate, there's two things you have to do. One, I don't want to tell you anything twice. So you better write down everything I say. And two, you have to join Mike Ferry Coaching. So I was fortunate to join Mike right away. Um, I left my job making one hundred and forty thousand dollars a year, and the first year, I didn't make any money at all. <laughs> um, we made combined. So I joined Alan, and he basically fired Katie right away. So, um, so you had her. left your one hundred and forty thousand dollar a year job. Yep. But then when you went to work for this broker who was who had an assistant and buyer's agent, the broker said, whoa, 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 I don't want to pay her yep. to teach okay. you how to yeah. sell real estate, right? Yeah, so he knew that Katie, my wife, would teach me real estate and he didn't want it to be on his dime. So he essentially let her go off the team and then it was the Katie and Richard team. And, and so the Katie we and Richard home. team was earning how much money at that time? <laughs> Zero. Yeah, no, Zero. The first, it's the hardest. I mean, we can had... any of you guys relate where all of a sudden you go from $140,000 a year plus, plus, plus to nothing? Yeah. Well, yeah, and that's what was can relate, huh? <laughs> is that uh, Katie was making really good money as a buyer's agent for Alan. And so once he let her off the team and it was just her and I, we were relying on my ability to go out and sell houses. And I didn't have that ability really yet. You know, I haven't developed that. So the first year was probably tough. I mean, I regretted that decision a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody did told you not to do it. You were thinking was right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I used to have to get to the office like an hour early and just sit in my car and tell myself how the future is going to be better than today. You know, Lots of affirmations. Wow. What a story. Great mindset. So I think you told me you said 15 or 18 transactions you guys actually close that year. Yeah. So my first year, and that's what made it so tough is I was on a 50, 50 split with my broker. Um, so every those deal. were the days. Yeah. So we did 18 transactions our first year and we netted $58,000. Whoa. And you paid for coaching. And I had $12,000 in coaching, which at the time was like a quarter of my income. And you have to pay taxes, Neil. Right, right. hundred percent. hundred. The only good thing is that the, what you were paying for coaching was tax deductible. Yeah. Yeah. I went from 140,000 to standing in line at the food bank is what I felt like. <laughs> So, okay. So you, you, I guess you could have went back to the 140 job. Was that possible? No. Um, basically, before I had left that job, I had asked them because I was. Uh, they had a compensation plan that they were changing, and I and I had asked for more commission, and they gave me an ultimatum. They said, "No, you know, this is as good as it's going to get." And so I trained somebody to take my job. <laughs> okay. So you burn that bridge too, not intentionally, yep. but that bridge yeah. burned. Yeah. All right. So you had to make money here. Had to make money and I had to make it fast. So what'd you do? Basically, uh, I mean, I got into role play right away, right? Um, I think that, that was the biggest thing because you have to practice your skills and get good at internalizing everything and not making it sound so scripted on the phone. Um, I already kind of had the accountability, right? Because I was not making the money I needed to make and just started working every single day. Got it. Uh, were you buying lists? Were you buy getting Zillow leads? What, what were you doing? 
Yeah, so initially, because I didn't have any money, uh, we couldn't afford the fancy dialers or anything like that. So what we, Katie and I did, is we got, um, I can't think of the name now. It, they just provide the numbers to all the uh, the houses, like the like a farm list. Are you talking like about, um, are you talking about the crisscross lists? Coal Realty. Coal, Coal Realty. Realty, right. So Coal Realty was like 50 bucks a month. I'd convinced Alan to buy that for me. And then I was hand dialing. And then Katie, my wife, would go in every day manually and pull all the for sale by owners off Zillow or realtor.com, for sale by owner.com. And then she would put those, she would print them and put them on my desk. And then I would just start calling. At that time, the market was doing really well, you know, so uh, there wasn't really any expireds to call in my market. So it was for sale by owner and a ton of just listed, just sold, and then database. And you were just dialing, dialing, dialing. Hand dialing. Hand dialing. Hand yeah, dialing. from my cell phone. And then I, I remember like once I got the scripts down and I'd gotten a few deals, I think I bought Red X. But I couldn't afford like the triple line dialer. So I only had the single line dialer. Right. Right. But you did this every day. Every day, uh, all day. And when you say yeah. every day, you're talking five days a week, seven days a week? Yeah, every day but Sunday. My wife and I, uh, well, our coach at the time, he said, you are gonna, you should at least have one day off a week. So right. my wife and I uh, would spend all day at the office. She would run out and get me lunch or bring me lunch or breakfast and sometimes dinner. And I would just call, you know, with a lot of just listed, just sold calls, it's a numbers game. You got to right. call a ton of them. So how many contacts do you think you were making a day? Uh, 50, 60. 50, 60 contacts a day because you had nothing else to do yeah. and you had no money. Yeah. On a so good day, you, I know I had a few days where I would hit 100. So you didn't have options. Yeah, and it's funny because if you go back in the numbers analyzer, my skills weren't that good. So it was like 500 contacts to one appointment. <laughs> <laughs> so how and many contacts to an appointment today? Uh, it's just under 100 today. Today? Yeah. Okay. Under 100 today. But you you have those numbers for the last six years? Yeah. Good for you. That's great. Fantastic. So in year one, which was 2018... You did 18 transactions. Right. Um, the second year was um, 2019. Yep. Oh, and you made like $58,000 that year, right? So the first year I made 58,000 uh, and I did 28 deals. The second year we did 33 and my split had gotten better. I did over, I did, um, hold on, let me pull the numbers up. I have them right here. Um, 28, we did 33 and I had made 189,000. Big difference. So you pretty much by the end of your second year had covered what you lost in your salary and your wife's salary. Right. Yep. More or less. Yeah. Okay. All right. It was still hard because like, you had good months and, and, you know, you still have down months and then et cetera. Oh, so you had the peaks and the valleys. I, and didn't I thought like we it. were the only one with good months and down months. You had those too? I mean, it was tough. I didn't know if I was going to get the hang of it. I thought by like year two, I should be like making a million bucks. Right. Okay. <laughs> good job. So fast forward to year five. You did 65 transactions last year, right? 65 and just under 33 million in volume, about $600,000. 600,000 in uh, commission income. Good yeah. for you. Congratulations. Thanks. Good stuff. So you're starting to get the hang of it. So do you still prospect a lot? Yeah, I still prospect every day and then three days a week in the evening and then occasionally, well, I do every other Saturday. Okay. You have children now or no? Yep. Yeah, I have two kids. Okay. 
So that, the third year, my that business. Cause, did that cause an issue sometimes? Uh, the kids pulling on you and. Yeah. Yeah. My wife's an amiable. So she's all about the family. And if I spend too much time here, she's wondering where I'm at. Right. Uh huh. Uh, yeah, that's been that's been tough. I have to get her to let me stay at least three days a week in the evenings. How how does that does that happen? Yeah. OK, good. All right. So you guys figured out how to do this. Yeah, if it was up to her, I'd probably be home all the time, though. <laughs> how, so let's talk about that just for a second. How do you manage that? Because that happens to a lot of us, maybe all of us at some point where we have family tugging on us a little bit and, you know, we're raring to go and we need to make the money and la, 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 la. So how does that, how do you manage that? You, you and your wife. Yeah. So in the beginning, it was really tough because we went from like having our separate jobs to working together full time. Right. So we would butt heads a lot. Um, then we had to clearly define who does what role. And then we had a kid my second year in the business. So that really changed dynamic because then she kind of moved away from the business. So she's not really, she wasn't in production. She wasn't really helping me as much anymore. We had to bring on an assistant. And um, then because we had the kid and she wanted me to spend time at home, I had to, we really had to redefine our goals and see, like I had to have her play a bigger part in our goal, right? It's no longer about me and my goal. It has to be something she can buy into as well. So she can allow me to do this. So if I don't do this, she can't have that. Right. And that's kind of how you balance it? Yep. Okay. Yeah, so like this this year we made a big change because I do spend a lot of time at the office if I if I can. If it was up to me, I would work all the time. Not that I don't love my family, but I enjoy seeing this grow, you know? And so Fridays, I get to the office a little bit later. I take my kids to school. It's the only day during the week I drop them off. And then Friday night, I leave here a little bit early and we go out on a date night. Oh, great. Take the kids? No. No, we're <laughs> leaving them. Screw those kids. <laughs> That's great. Okay. So... Right now, you're try you're working on growing your business. Uh, you're doing really well. You're at um, your goal this year is 85 transactions. Yep, my goal is 85, and then we've brought on another agent uh, to help us out, and her goal is 36. So if if we both had our goals, we'd do about 120 transactions. And 120 transactions, including what you make off of her, would give you about how much money? Richard. Yeah, so this year when we hit our goal, we'll be just over a million dollars. Woo! Yeah. So it took you seeing it first five, six years ago that it could be done. Right. And then your passion, your work ethic, your focus kept you in the game. Sounds to me like maybe you losing your job and your wife losing her job and you didn't have any more down to go that that helped you propel yourselves. Yeah, I had to quit that job. And then I knew that Alan, I mean, he was so successful. He's still successful. Um, I knew that if I just did what he said and, and I came to the Mike Ferry events and I saw other agents doing it, if I was willing to endure that process, eventually I would be there. So we, we call that blind faith. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because, well, in your case, it wasn't so blind because you had this mentor, leader, friend, Alan. Does he go to the Mike Ferry events? Yes. Yeah. He was coached with Cindy Fullman up until she left. Ah, okay. Does he still have a big office? Um, no, he never had a big office. He was always just him, his wife, his sister, an assistant, and then my wife, like a TC, and then my wife. Does this guy have a property management business? No. Oh, I thought I met a guy recently that kind of sounds like him. Oh, I know. He was in Lompoc, California. That's what it was. Um, interesting. Very interesting. So so let me ask you, Richard, I mean, what do you think your 
secret uh, your superpower is i think i really enjoy the things that are hard you know i don't have to like doing it but i just i i try to whatever i do i try to figure out a way to enjoy it and push through it got it yeah clearly you did that so so what did you do let's go back to that first and second year what did you do to make yourself enjoy that a little bit because it sounds like you were doing thousands of contact thousands of contacts yeah yeah so a couple things is like i have a zoom accountability so i had a friend a couple agents at the same time had joined coaching and so we just became friends over zoom and then the second thing is that I got into uh, a role play group and everybody in that role play group uh, was at a higher level than me. I think in that role play group, the average agent was doing about 35 deals. And there are some agents in there that were doing 100. So when I started role playing with those guys, I just kind of developed the same habits as them. I would ask them questions, what they're doing. And then I would start applying it to my business. And I just knew that if I kept doing what they were doing, there was no other way but to get better. So Richard, you were making $140,000. You in year two or so matched that more or less. You saw that you could make a million bucks through Alan showing it to you. But how did you stay in the game? <laughs> I mean, what about the days you don't feel like doing what you're supposed to be doing? So um, I've never really shared this before, but my dad, um, my parents got divorced when I was really young and my dad wound up homeless. And when I was at my last sales job, when I was working, I was actually working selling cars. I hated selling cars. And I was driving into the office. I was talking to my dad who he was at that time, he was homeless and he would come to my house to do his laundry. He was diabetic. And I would always call him just to make sure that he had, he was like feeling, you know, feeling okay. And, you know, he wasn't going to die out there. And so I called him one day and I said, dad, I really don't want to go to work today. And he says, well, then don't. And I hung up on him and I was thinking like, whatever he says, just do the exact opposite. <laughs> so every day that I don't feel like doing this, I think about the conversation with my dad. So like, it'll be like, well, then don't, you know? And it's like, well, no, I have to, I have to. Interesting, very interesting stuff. But he told you not, not to go, but you're starting to make good money. And uh, you uh, you said up front you were pretty frugal, so I would suspect you still are. Yeah, so now it's really cool because now that we're making good money, we're able to invest it. And so um, since I've gotten started, you know, the first year we didn't make any money. Um, as of January for my birthday, I bought ourselves another rental. So we have six six rental properties or you six know, stores. Sorry, some three, some three, people three, buy a bracelet. You yeah. buy a rental. Yeah. <laughs> I love that thinking. Good for you. Congratulations. Well, that's uh, the one can thing we that's open really this cool up about a little? This business. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Again. That's one thing that's really cool about this business. How's that? Well, one, we don't own any of the inventory. So you literally can just show up with a cell phone, call somebody, and they give you a percentage of all their hard-earned work. That's pretty cool. It's a great way to look at it. I, I do want to ask you a question. You said you hated selling cars, but you love selling real estate. What's the difference? So I don't know if you've ever been to a car lot. <laughs> well, I've been to a car lot, but I've never sold do you, cars. Do you enjoy the process of buying the car? I hate it. Yeah. Yeah, so you work with those individuals that are constantly like, I call it the, the like uh, they couldn't get hired anywhere else, so they sell cars. Oh and wow! It's around <laughs> these people that also like hate their job, and so the mindset of everybody is just so negative. And that's what's great about here is like we're actually here to serve our clients and help them out. And the car lot, if you came in to buy a car, I'm not helping you. 
because eventually I have to negotiate against you. Right. Interesting. Whereas here, Very I get to negotiate on your behalf. I get to help you buy something or sell it, and you're really happy with our service. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Hey, you open to uh, answering a few questions? Sure. Excellent. Okay, questions for Richard. Questions for Richard. Who wants to go first? Pop up your hand or just go. Anyone? Hi, Richard. So yes. how did you get into that uh, role play group with people who are doing 35 deals more? So I just happened to be at a Mike Ferry event and I was asking for cards, you know, like we normally do for a role play. And at that time, one of the agents told me I, about this group. And it yes. was led by uh, Ryan Comstock. It's a West Coast role play group. Yeah, I think I think he's still running a group, isn't he? Yeah. Sorry, Richard, you were breaking up. I think Richard, uh, Robert Constant still runs a group. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Good. Right. Neil, Neil, where, where's where's Richard from? What's what city? Reno, Nevada. 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 Reno, Nevada. So uh, quick question. Um, Richard, yeah. what what year did you start it? Uh, how long ago? I didn't catch that. So this will be my sixth year in the business. I started in 2018. Thank you. And are you still belonging to the same role play group that uh, you mentioned? Yeah. Yep. Could you uh, Say the name of the group again or the contact number or how to get to it. Um, so the Ladies guy and gentlemen, who runs it, his name's Ryan Comstock. He's yeah. an agent in Tucson. I would just this go, is, go on and Google him. Thank you. The group is not the answer. Role playing is the answer every day. Right, right. Richard? That's right. Okay. If I can't get into Robert Comstock's group, that's it. I am not going to role play ever again. <laughs> yeah, no, you're still Neil Schwartz group. Right? I don't, you don't have up. to join what we do. The point is that you have to do this every day. And most people don't. And when you meet but, them, you will beat them. But Neil, right, don't Richard? you agree that if right. Neil, but don't you agree that if you do um, belong to a group that's a little bit more experienced than you are in role playing, that it will help you in, in enhance your ability to it, role play it, better. You're not going to sell me on that. No, <laughs> no, you're not going to sell me on that. That's bull. No, no, but I'm but still, but still do it's the role play every morning. Because everybody's looking every okay, but no, no, but still do your role play every morning. Every I, morning, eight o'clock, we role time. play. If you have that mentality, you're not going to play at the level you want to play at. Okay, I'm. I'm. I, this is a very dangerous conversation, <laughs> not for me, but for those of you that are in and out of groups and in and out of really role play. Okay. Yeah, I think if you just like like another thing that I did is I took the objection handlers and I made them into flashcards. Mm -hmm. And so my first year in the business, um, I would hand out the flashcards of the objections and I would give them to people in that office. And if I couldn't respond to it in the same way that was on the back, I would give them $50. That works really well. And then I used to every day role play with my wife. It got so bad that like we would be laying in bed at night and I would like role playing listing presentations. Whispering sweet nothings. Yeah. When do you plan on moving? <laughs> oh man. Yeah, we used to do that all the time. We play the question game in the car, like Mike talks about. Uh -huh. Get to the point where my wife was like, "Look, you need to get away from me." <laughs> uh, quick question. Go ahead, Richard. When you shadow the first six months, um, what what were you learning most? from those six months that you shadowed? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, 
basically how to have conversations about real estate, what it looked like, kind of like what questions sellers might have, what I would need to know. I got to see him like write listing agreements, negotiate offers. I get to hear all those conversations. And and then the first year when your income was so low compared to the, the fixed salary, were you nervous? And then what did you do different to bring your, <laughs> your numbers up from there? Yeah. So when I was making 58,000 my first year, I was like, there was days I was crying while I was driving to the office, you know, um, I was kind of raised or I, I'm always of the belief that like you should be able to provide for your wife. And so when I knew we were living off our salary or our savings for that first year, I felt like I wasn't doing my duties as a husband. And so that was really hard. I just had to remind myself that if I can get through this on the other side of that is, you know, greatness. So here's an interesting thought. You were making $140,000 a year and you were pretty good in direct sales. I would say you're damn good in direct sales. Different, different world. Okay. Right. All right. You went to work for a guy that was charging you 50, 50. Mm -hmm. Okay. Arguably for a year. Okay. You knew you had to pay somebody for that. Right. Would you believe in our company, we have people that have the opportunity to have mentors, great people like yourself, Richard, and great people like Andy, and they won't even pay 20, 25% on a deal or two. Yeah. So my second year in the business, it was my goal. And I wound up paying Alan, my first broker, $100,000. And that's and, what it costs to go to Harvard, ladies and gentlemen. And that's what I wanted. I, I honestly knew that if I paid him the money he had to invest in my future right and so we he was committed to help me succeed and i could come to him with any question at any time because i was i was taking his advice and doing it and you were being go back and not pay him i i have to tell you in this whole conversation in this whole 40 minutes or so this is so critical right now to all of your futures those of you that are newer and even some of you that have a lot of experience, but really don't know how to take a listing and put the thing together and actually get it closed. I mean, there's no secrets here. It's just, you know, I mean, I guess for our company, how'd you like to walk around with uh, following Melinda or uh, the Scalios, or Mark and Al, or Karen Myatt, or, you know, I can go on and on and on, and for a 50-50 split for a year, pay them $100,000, and now he's making $600,000 on his way to a million bucks in mm -hmm. five, six years. I mean, mm -hmm. this is an absolute no-brainer to me, but what do I know? Um, okay, good stuff. Other questions for Richard? Boy, that was a Great. I have a question for Richard. Just yes. So when you were making sixty-five units and you were making six hundred thousand, did you actually have a team already, or how does that work? Yeah. So I hired my buyers, or we brought on. I call her a buyer's agent, but we're actually teaching her to do listings too. Um, I brought her on in October of last year. So last year we did 65 and I brought her on at the end of the year. So okay. how many of the deals did she do last year? Um, six. Okay. So you were able to teach her and help her. So her six part of your 65? Correct. Okay. Got it. So, so you guys did 59 and she did six. Yeah, and and our agree at that time, I mean, she I'm just handing like our clients over to her. It's not like she's going out and finding them. Okay. Yeah. So she's really not prospecting per se. If you uh, have a buyer lead, you're handing it to her. Yeah. This year what we've changed is we've teaching her how to prospect. So all of her deals will be pretty much generated. That's great. But in so the beginning, in the yeah. beginning, you gave her deals. 
Yeah, I gave her all our like any of our buyers last year. We still give her all the buyers, but she's going to be doing a lot more generating herself. Great. Okay, so you concentrated on listing. Not one last question I wanted to ask you, Wendy. I mean, how many hours do you do you work as far as prospecting, and how many contacts do you do? So I prospect right now about four, between four and six hours a day. There's three days a week that I stay late. Those will be longer prospecting days. Um, but every day I prospect from eight to 11 and then a, usually an hour before I leave the office. And then the last question I have with you, how do you eliminate destruction? Like how strong are you at that? Because that's our problem. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question. So um, I'm always getting better at that. Like everybody, I mean, think that happens to everybody. We get distracted, but my assistant takes everything away from me. She's fully licensed. Uh, she's not allowed to interrupt me during prospecting. So we have a 10 minute meeting in the morning, mm -hmm. uh, in between my prospecting. So I'll step away. We go over any burning questions she has and then everything's saved for the afternoon. Uh, all of my calls go directly to her. Beautiful. All right. Thank you. Richard, I, I have a question. I, you know, what books do you read or what, uh, or what pot podcast or YouTube videos do you listen to when you have like uh, three days or four days of, I'm not sure, maybe you got better at this, but when you have like three or four days where you're calling, 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 and you can't book an appointment. At the beginning, I'm, I'm assuming at the beginning, because right now you're probably very good at what you do. Yeah, that's that's a great question. That's definitely something I struggled with a lot as a new agent, you know, especially like you just feel like you're doing all the work and you, you haven't heard, like it's not coming to you. There's a great book called um, by Trevor Moab. It takes what it takes. And his story is really just about falling in love with the process. And we know that it's just going to happen, you know. It's just the law of averages. It's just going to happen. And you just have to know what's going to happen. You don't know where it's going to come from. So here's a great example is yesterday. Um, I've been calling all week. I recently had hip surgery. And like I just feel like, man, I haven't got one listing appointment this week. And then I just got a referral from our CPA. Didn't even call him or anything. He's like, hey, this guy needs to sell his house. Can you call him? You know? So if you just keep doing the work, eventually it's going to come to you. So I have a question. So what do you call? Do you call expires? Do you call absentees? Yep. Yeah, I call absentees, uh, just listed, just sold, um, database. We call expires for sale by owner, canceled. I just had a comment, Richard, because um, it's funny because, you know, every time Neil interviews someone, you know, people ask like the sources and stuff. And I have the same question and they all say the same thing. So so would you say it's just <laughs> it's not really like how many sources and which ones you use, but really being consistent in the ones you use? And how do you do that, dude? Because every, there's some days where you don't feel like doing it, you know. So how do you like stay consistent, like Abigail said, and keep dialing? when you're not getting the results for the first part of the morning or so on and so forth? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So it really comes down to like what your goals are, right? So for me, when I want to make a million dollars, it's not that I want a million dollars. I want what the million dollars will do. So my wife and I have clearly mapped out exactly what we'll do with the million dollars. And we've attached our goal to that. So when I come in here to do this, I know that in order to get to the million, I got to hit so many contacts per day or whatever. I also know that if I just keep doing this, I'm going to run into somebody. Uh, the second thing is, is we have like processes for all the lead follow-up and everything. So like our assistant helps us with the lead follow-up. So like when I'm making a lot of contacts, we actually have like a follow-up system that's helping us to convert everything as well. Another question. How do you clear, how do you get that vision clear? Like, you know what you want to do with the million dollars. How do you clear? I find it hard for me to like 
I don't know. What do I want to do with the money? I find it hard to define. Like, how did you define it? Starving to death. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, I knew where I, like, I, my parents, when I was a kid, my dad worked at Sears, my mom worked at Kmart, you know, like, the, we weren't well off, and I knew that I wanted more, and I knew people that had more, and as you get around the Mike Ferry people, you see people that have even more, and so I think, like, you just kind of think of the life you want to have, like, do you like flying on Southwest, you know, would you rather be up in first class, so if, if the answer to that is yes, like, go online and see what you know, uh, uh, first class ticket was last January, January of 2022. Um, we had set a goal in 2021 that if I sold over $400,000, I was going to take my whole family to Hawaii. And so by June of that year, my coach made me book the trip. So I spent the $20,000 to book the Hawaii trip. So then, but I wound up that year hitting $458,000. So you got to like see what you want and then set a high accountability towards getting that. That's awesome, good. Richard. Thank you. Well, well said, Richard. Thank you. Um, good questions, question. Kamal. Tiffany, go ahead. Richard, uh, where you are at, is there a lot of MFO agents? I don't know. I don't like... I don't really know a lot of the agents in my market. You're not paying attention to that. I just sit, like, if you saw my office, it's a little, they call it the phone booth here, and that's all it is. Good for you. I have a question, have a Richard. Question. I just thought of another one. I'm sorry. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, whoever that was. Sorry. Uh, it was me. Yeah. Uh, Richard, I have a question. Uh, do you, could you prospect a lot throughout the day? Um, do you ever go previewing property when you're not prospecting or do you ever make the time for that or do you just. So I did uh, a lot in the beginning. Okay. I don't do it so much now because like I'm out in the field quite a bit more. But yeah. yeah in the beginning I did a lot. So Richard, how many is a lot? Every day. So in the beginning, One a my day, wife and I. In a day. Uh, probably like five or six houses a day. I didn't give him that answer, you guys. <laughs> yeah, in the beginning, in the beginning, I didn't have a lot of time to do anything because I wasn't selling a lot of houses or like I didn't, I had a lot of time because I wasn't doing anything. And so no money. My wife and I would like pick a side of town that I had never been into. And we would go have lunch over there and then we would tour five homes and then come back to the office and I'd make my calls. Good job. We have a little more. But, but Richard, Richard, did you prospect around those homes or you just previewed them? Yeah. So then I would go in there. Then I would go back to the office. I'd pull up a list on that co realty and then I would hand dial around the houses. Thank so, you. Yeah. The, there's our group's supposed to preview five houses a day, five days a week, and door knock 10 around each one. Yeah, if you good. got a dollar for everyone that did that, you'd still be broke. <laughs> well, I highly suggest it, especially like as a new agent. I mean, you're going to gain a lot of market experience in there, and you can actually talk about the comparables. Hmm. We got to go past this one. I, they're, they don't want to do that idea. Let's cut. <laughs> you got to have something else. Come on, give us a magic pill, Richard. <laughs> I wish there was. It's just hard work and uh, stay staying consistent. Good job. Like, All right, other questions, really other questions for Richard. You need to do it. Other questions for Richard. I'll go. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, hi. Uh, so my question is, what time do you start your day? And how do you start your day? So at like gym. my day at the office or like my day from when I wake up? Morning routine. Just like morning routine. If you can go whatever amount, you can go yeah, all day. So I get, up, I get up really early, like 3.45 in the morning. I don't recommend everybody do this, okay? Just just I do it because I like to have time by myself in the morning. Um, then I drink my coffee and then I go to the gym um, then I come back, I get into the office around that. I have breakfast with my kids at like six 30 in the morning. And then I get to the office by seven. 
Okay, and I'm sorry, I missed. What time do you prospect, you said? Like in the morning and at 8, evening? 8 to 11, sometimes 11.30. And then three days a week, I do it in the evenings from like 5 to 7. And what do you do in between? Go ahead, sorry. Do what do you do in between like 12 to 5 or? So on days where I have stuff going on, I'll go run those errands or, you know, go to lunch, uh, work on the business, files, like meet, uh, talk to clients, give them updates. Um, some other days I'll just get back on the phone. Right now it's kind of tougher in my market. We don't have a lot of expired, so I'm having to prospect a little bit more. We, we don't have that problem. We get expires all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, Richard, I just wanted to make a comment. Huh. Go ahead, come on. I wanted, I wanted to make a comment because you just said um, there's no, there's not much expired, so you got to prospect more. Yeah. You froze, or I froze. He froze. So Richard, how do you back. wake up at three forty-five? What time do you go to bed usually? If you don't I mind go me to asking, bed about that. nine. Um, yeah, I get up. I like. I also have a cold plunge at my house, so I cold plunge. It's kind of. I, I have a whole morning routine. It's kind of crazy. Um, sorry, Richard. I think I got cut off. You did. Go ahead. Okay, I caught what you said. You said there's not many expires in your market. So you had to prospect more. And I heard Tony Smith say something yesterday. He said, you know, the market and the economy, it never dictates your income. It just dictates how hard you have to work for the goals you have, you know? So it was, it, it's such a good reminder that it really doesn't matter if you have no expires or you have a lot of them, you know, like if you're not doing the work, then it doesn't matter, you know? So that, that was such a good reminder, Richard. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Good job. Excellent. Okay, unmute yourselves, please. Unmute yourselves. Let's give them a big hand. Great interview. Great information. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Richard, I, if you have a hard stop, I totally get it. Uh, what we'd normally do at the end of this is we go around the room and ask, what did we learn? So you're welcome to hang around. Um, or if you can't, we understand, we'll send the uh, copy of the interview to you in a few days. Okay. Well, I appreciate you guys' time, and hopefully you guys learned a lot. Huh? Yes. I certainly did, so thank you. Thank you. See ya. All right. Good job. Thank Excellent. You. All right. So what did we learn from Richard today? What did we learn? I love the fact that he makes it seem so simple. He's just determined and he has, like he said, he has his little, you know, phone booth or cubicle and uh, he's just like dialing, dialing and he's doing need follow up. And that's, it's just a very simple process. So we just have to get up and do it. That's what we have to do. Yeah. Just not a lot of drama in his life. I mean, he's got major drama. Look, losing your job and losing your, your income, that's major drama. And for some people would probably paralyze him. Yes. He took it and said, okay, okay, I got to hit the ground running. And that's what he's been doing is running. And every year it makes a little bit more money, a little bit more money. He says he's conservative. So I think part of his keeping going is the fact that he is conservative and he has to keep going. And he's not worried about bills because he keeps going. So that's great. Good. What else do we learn today? I think he's driven with pain. Oh, clearly. <laughs> I, I actually think he, loves pain. he not lost his job and his wife didn't lose his her job, that he might not be quite as far along. Now, yeah. I'm, not I'm not recommending that all of you go break, broke tomorrow. But for <laughs> some of you, it wouldn't hurt. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good job. Uh, what else do we learn today? So, Neil, what do you think his personality style is? Laid back. <laughs> what do you think? I think he's not analytical for sure. 
He's not analytical. He's not an expressive. So let's yeah, eliminate right. those two. How else would you eliminate? What else could you eliminate? I think he has to be a driver. It's just growing driver. <laughs> He's not, it's a, well, yeah. he, uh, he must please people because he has a lot of clients and a lot of, he might not be pleasing his wife, but they're, they're, at, they're at different issues. Uh, so he could very well be an amiable. He um, he always he he couldn't wait to help. He couldn't wait to do this. He's very excited about the opportunity to do this. He wants to do a good job. He's very interested in doing a good job and presenting the information. So uh, definitely could be a driver, but I think it's more he's a analytical and maybe under pressure a driver. Um, I think he's more of analytical, Neil, because remember how what she what he did was he had to make his goal. In order to make this goal, he has to analyze everything that he does to make this goal. This is what we do next year. What we're we gonna do? You know what I mean? So he's analyzing everything. I I hear you, but I don't hear him anal analyzing it with numbers. Okay. It's concepts. I have to talk to more people. How many more people? Well, he's keeping track of his numbers is not necessarily make him analytical. Hmm. Okay. So, yeah. but it I doesn't think matter. If he's analytical, he wouldn't quit his job to, to jump into uh, like uh, something that he's making 140,000. If he's analytical, he wouldn't dare to jump into something new like that. Perhaps. Perhaps. You're right. I don't know many analyticals that would do that. Maybe you're right. um, okay. So what else did we learn today? Hey, Neil, he said, um, I got the magic pill. He said, hard work and stay consistent. That's it. You got it. Marco, you win. Good job. <laughs> hard work and consistency wins out all the time. I, I just thought this was really good especially the parts about previewing and role play. Did anybody get those? I, I'm telling you, you want to talk about magic pills? That's that's them. Uh, okay, let's analyze the 180 people we've interviewed. Would you agree that almost everyone, if not everyone, learns and continues to learn what to say and how to say it? Would you agree with that? 180 people, mostly earning a million dollars plus. Number two, at somewhere in their career, the beginning, now, et cetera, they know the inventory. They have learned the inventory. So there's two points. Hello. Where does his name? His name is Richard Berman, B-E-R-M-A-N. Oh. In fact, his contact information is in the uh, chat. chat. I'll put it in again. All right. Anyone else have any comments on what they learned today? I learned that maybe we need coaching. Maybe. But maybe we need to be coachable. Because coaching starts with, here's an interesting thing. Coaching starts with two things. You have to, well, three things. A, you have to preview property. B, you have to learn the scripts and dialogues. And C, you have to track your numbers. If you're not doing those, and those you can do without a coach, because um, you're getting coaching on that every day. How many of you, have heard me talk about coaching, previewing, and tracking your numbers almost every day for however long you've been with me. Yeah, exactly. I, that's it. That's it. I mean, there's a lot of stuff here, but that's, go there. And some of you that are actually, when I ask you the question, how many properties have you previewed Hello. yesterday? Um, I'm getting some Thanks answers. And that's been really, really, really cool. So 